I want you to imagine that you have a giant glass lens placed between you and something you're looking at, like, I don't know, a sailboat. Just, just work with me here. And you're trying to figure out how big the lens is, how thick it is, if there's any impurities in it, if it's really even made of glass or maybe even something else. How would you do it? Well, you would look through the lens and look at the image of the sailboat that's produced. Then you'd go around to look at any other sailboats and oh you spot a sailboat that looks pretty similar pretty similar has you know the right color the right shapes it seems about the same and you would compare and you would contrast you would look at this telescope over you would look at this sailboat over here and you'd look at the sailboat right through the lens and if you knew how lenses worked, if you knew about the properties of refraction and the bending of light rays and the response to different kinds of materials, you could figure out what the lens is made of, how big the lens is, what shape the lens is, how the glass inside of it is arranged. Is it maybe thicker on this side and thinner on this side? You can use it to figure out the contents of the lens. Well, we play this exact same trick, but not with glass lenses in the universe, because that would be kind of impractical, but with gravitational lenses, because we know that gravity bends the path of light. Einstein predicted this. This is a central feature of general relativity, and in fact led to one of the first predictions and validations of general relativity where Einstein said, hey, if you look at stars near the edge of the sun, that sun, that light, that starlight will get bent a little bit and the stars will look like they're in the wrong position. Then Sir Arthur, Sir Arthur Eddington led an expedition so he could look at stars near the sun during an eclipse when it's, you know, dark enough to look at stars near the sun and they were in the wrong position and by the amount predicted by general relativity. Yay, Einstein. So we know that space-time itself can bend and warp and flex, and there's hills and there's valleys and there's contortions in, in whatever else fabrics do. They fold, I guess. Um, and light is obligated to follow those hills and valleys and bends and folds. Light wants to follow a straight line. It wants to go in one direct straight line, but because the geometry underneath it is dynamic and changing and flexed, it has to follow the path. It's like if you're walking across a mountain range, you can't go in a straight line because that would involve drilling through a mountain and that's kind of hard. Instead, you have to go up the mountain and back down the mountain in order to get to your destination. Even though you never turn left, you never turn right, you follow a straight line putting one foot in front of the other, you end up at your destination following a straight line, but you went up and over the hill. So the light has to follow a path. The point is that gravity can act like a lens. If you have a massive object, and I mean really, really big, like, I don't know, a galaxy cluster, home to you, over a thousand galaxies, the most massive gravitationally bound structures in the universe, that's big enough where it doesn't just act like a little lens where you have to do deep, complicated statistical analysis. You can literally see this in a picture. You can see this with your eyes, not your eyes directly because clusters are far away, but if you have a telescope and take a picture of the cluster, then you can look at the picture, you get the point. What you see, what you see is the cluster itself is made up of, you know, a thousand galaxies or so, plus dark matter, plus some gas. But the galaxies them small, themselves are very, very small compared to the cluster. So you can see through the cluster the same way you can look through a flock of birds or a swarm of bees. You can see through the gaps. And in the gaps, there's a bunch of background galaxies. There's galaxies that are even further away than the cluster that have absolutely nothing to do with the cluster whatsoever. And we see the light from these background galaxies distorted just exactly as if that galaxy cluster was a giant piece of glass in the sky, a weird and distorted 
a not typical piece of glass, but a piece of glass, like a lens, we will see the same image. The image from a galaxy will get bent into an arc, or maybe we'll get lumpy and curved. Sometimes if it's lined up just right, we'll get an entire ring image of a galaxy. We'll see, it'll be bent weird. Um, we might get multiples. We might see an image of a galaxy over here on one side and this another image of the exact same background galaxy on the other side. This situation is called a strong gravitational lens. And by comparing the distortion of galaxies that we see behind a galaxy cluster to the distortion of galaxies we see out in some random patch where we're not looking through a galaxy cluster, we can compare and contrast, we can do the math, we can run the numbers, and since we know how gravity bends the path of light, we can figure out what the cluster is made of and where that stuff is. Like the easy mode is just to say, okay, the mass of the cluster is this much to cause that much lensing. With more detailed analysis on expert mode, you can figure out where the density, where is it densest, where is it least dense, are there any weird lumps or patterns or distributions to the mass in the cluster? And this is one of our prime pieces of evidence for the existence of dark matter. It's by looking at gravitationally lensed structures where we look through a galaxy cluster at some background galaxies and that light from the background galaxy gets bent, we can figure out what everything is going on inside a galaxy cluster, whether we can see it or not. And we have a bajillion examples, the bullet cluster, the train wreck cluster, even just normal everyday clusters where the matter is concentrated based on gravitational lensing is not where the galaxies are. The, or just the galaxies themselves are not enough to explain the mass of a cluster. We have tons of other evidence too. I did a bunch of videos on dark matter, but I just wanted to dig in a little bit more into this idea of gravitational lensing. There's another trick that strong gravitational lensing can do. And that's, can, that's it's, it can tell us about the expansion of the universe itself. I know it sounds crazy. Like how can you just look at one object, like a galaxy cluster with some junk behind it and figure out the expansion of the universe? Don't you have to look at like a bunch of stuff, map out speeds as a function of distance, build up like a redshift versus distance relation. Uh, then you can actually do it with a single galaxy cluster if you have good enough data, of course. The trick here, the trick here is that because light follows multiple paths in a lens system, we can we get multiple image images of the same background object. So if there's a cluster hanging out between, say, my head and you, then some of the light from my face will go right through the cluster and you'll see it just fine. Some light might go this way, might start off going this way, and normally it would totally miss you. It would go way over here. But because gravity acts like a lens, it gets bent, and you see it. Same here from the other side. Light that would normally go in this direction gets bent, its path gets bent, and ends up going towards you. So you see multiple images of my face coming in from different directions, following different paths and taking different amounts of time to get there. That's the trick. If you're watching an image, like a distant galaxy or my face or whatever that's being lensed by a massive galaxy cluster that's sitting in between us, if something changes, if a supernova goes off, if I heat up or if I contract or if you know I start talking, one image maybe takes path A, takes a certain amount of time to reach you. Another image takes path B and takes a different amount of time to get you. You have something that you know the, the brightness of occurring at taking different paths through the universe to get to you with different amounts of time. Uh, that's a measure of the expansion of the universe. That distance, that difference in timing can tell you about the expansion of the universe as it relates to these two paths between you and that distant object. 
And using that, you can re- you can figure out a Hubble constant or a Hubble value at that redshift. You can map the expansion history of the universe, or at least start to. And that's pretty handy. That's pretty handy. And that gives us, again, a completely independent handle on cosmology. It's not our best method. It's not our most robust method, because as you can imagine, making these measurements is super difficult. But it is possible, and it gives us a completely different method that doesn't rely on any other cosmological method. So gravitational lensing is this wonderful tool that allows us to access dark matter, that allows us to access the expansion of the universe using a different tool, not waiting for supernova to go off, not looking at the motions of galaxies or how bright galaxies or stars are. It's a completely independent method. The good news is it agrees with all the other methods, which, you know, if it didn't, we'd have some problems. And the even better news is it's totally independent. Thank you, Einstein. If you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash PMSire. That's how I keep all my education and outreach activities going. Uh, And then when you're done with that, you can uh, watch another video. Won't that be fun?